Hi everyone, uh, here in the room and also uh, on Zoom. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Hoffmann. I teach um, German and European history here at the history department. And it's my great pleasure um, to welcome, on behalf of the Institute for European Studies, uh, the German Historic Institute, Washington Pacific Office, and the Department of History and German. Uh, our speaker today, Philip Wagner. Um, Philip um, is a visiting scholar here at the Institute of European Studies. Um, he's a Humboldt Fellow, a Pierre Lin, uh, Fellow um, of the Humboldt Foundation, arrived last summer um, and has a couple of months left. So if you want to connect with him after this talk, um, he's still here at Berkeley for a few months. Um, Philip is um, an assistant professor, researcher at uh, the Department of History of Education at the Martin Luther uh, Universität in Halle Wittenberg. Um, he received his, his PhD in 2014 uh, in modern history um, at Humboldt University, um, and uh, the dissertation was transformed into a book on urban planning, urban planning um, in between 1900 and 1960, international experts, technocrats, uh, technocratic elites, transnational history of the technocratic elites taking urban planning as an example. And this book came out in 2016 in German. He's now working on a new book, um, and I think what we will hear today is the first chapter of this book. Um, it's a project on education and citizenship in the Federal Republic of Germany uh, from the immediate post war years and the Allies of the Occupation until um, yeah, the first decade uh, after reunification when West Germany absorbed or the West German educational system absorbed um, the, the communist um, East German education system. Um, and this is also going to be, well, maybe I should mention first uh, that he recently published um, um, a special issue of the journal European Review of History um, titled Molding Democratic Citizens, Democracy, Citizenship, and Education in Post-1945 Western Europe. So if you want to read up on some of the things that, that Philip will talk about today, um, that would be a good place to start. Um, and the talk today um, is entitled Unequal Re-Education, Schooling and Democracy in West Germany, 1945-1945. Please join me in welcoming um, Philip Wagner. Yeah, um, <clears throat> hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks also to the IES and the GHI for making this happen today and thanks to all of you for showing up today despite your busy schedules in the middle of the semester. What I will do today um, is uh, yeah, to talk a bit about what I've done over the last couple of months here in Berkeley. Um, at the center of my talk stand the ambivalences of education and democracy in the post-war decade. And well, yeah, you may ask yourself, why is it relevant to reevaluate this period, which is one of the most thoroughly researched epochs in modern German history? And the aim of my talk is to argue that these post-war controversies I'm focusing on today um, tell us a lot about the origins of our disputes about inclusion and exclusion in contemporary democracies. Um, these um, controversies gained traction due to the right, rise of right-wing populism over the last decade, I would say. Experts and intellectuals point to the nexus between educational and participatory inequality in Germany. Those with a low educational attainment and a low income for a long time only limitedly participated in contemporary democracy and sometimes even tend to support right-wing populist initiatives. And on the other hand, academically trained uh, middle to upper class citizens dominate not only the parliaments but also the contemporary advocacy networks, action groups, and grassroots movements of today. Um, against the background of these uh, diagnoses, these experts appeal for more programs to integrate the marginalized communities into democratic forums. Other experts um, object to this notion of a class-based German democracy. Some seek to demonstrate increasing participation of those with a lower educational attainment 
um, over the last 30 years. Um, others hold that liberal societies have to accept social injustice. These inequalities could even help democracies, these experts believe, when engaged citizens emerge as teachers of democracy in front of the broader public. The aim of my talk isn't to settle this conflict, but rather to reveal its longer history. For that reason, I go back to, or to West Germany, to post-war West Germany, in order to study the conflicts around the attempts to mold young people with different socioeconomic backgrounds and different gender identities into democratic citizens against the backdrop of mass violence and the Nazi dictatorship. In what way did elite and German lawmakers gear their programs toward the perceived needs of different social groups? How did they differentiate it between target audiences? And how did students respond to these schemes? Which citizenship ideas did they champion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, state-sponsored programs? I asked these questions by looking at curricula, student councils, and student newspapers in West Germany's differentiated landscape of secondary education. In the post-war decade, secondary education represented a three-partite or even quadripartite system. 87% of the students went to lower secondary schools, 3% attended recently introduced middle secondary schools, and these graduates of lower and middle secondary schools sometimes continued their education in non-compulsory vocational schools as part of their vocational training. And only 9%, and this is important for the um, for my talk, only 9% of the students attended higher secondary schools, and these were the only schools which prepared students for university education. By uh, studying education and democracy in the post-war decades, um, I engaged with a historiography that claims that schools played an important role in the cautious yet ultimately successful democratization of West Germany, and you see some of these works here on this slide. These studies uh, dovetail with a number of other works um, devoted to how democratic attitudes slowly filtered into gradually increasing parts of the West German public during the 1930s and 50s. Against this pleasing and ultimately self-congratulatory narrative of a slowly emerging democracy in the 1940s and 50s, I argue that education programs didn't expand democratic attitudes evenly across society. Instead, citizenship education schemes reaffirmed older, more traditional social hierarchies in post-war West Germany. And um, charting how these social inequalities beset West German democracy, I tap on the social history of the post-war decades. This scholarship has drawn attention to how the increasingly subtle hierarchies of class, gender, and educational attainment continue to shape West German society during the post-war decades. And the cryptography of democracy is only very slowly catching up with the scholarship in social history. One example is a recent book by Martin Conway. And my aim today is to contrib contribute to what we may call a social history of democracy um, of, uh, yeah, in West Germany, or in post-war West Germany. Pursuing this agenda also allows me to delve deeper into the local and regional diversities of West German democracy. Many studies about education and democracy in West Germany have tried to identify national trajectories. However, they have obscured the multiple programs and, and controversies on the local and regional levels that resulted out of the fact that states and not the federal government had and still have jurisdiction over education in West German uh, federalism. So I will use today the frighteningly different examples of West Berlin and North Rhine-Westphalia demonstrate how the conflicts around democracy and education developed along distinct local and regional lines in the post-war decade. I'll unpack um, this argument in three steps before I wrap up the gist of my talk um, in the conclusion and situate it in, a, in, the border, in the context of a broader project I am pursuing here in Berlin. Okay, so first, I will talk a bit about the general context of the multiple programs to transform West German youth into democratic citizens. I won't give you a full overview about the multiple post-war programs to denazify and democratize West German youth. Rather, I'll sketch out the general framework of the post-war debate on democracy, education, and social justice 
in the Western zones of occupation. And I seek to demonstrate that it would be too simple uh, to claim a natural connection between uh, ideas of democracy and notions of inclusion. Rather, uh, I would uh, tend to say that different conceptions of inclusion and exclusion were compatible uh, to democracy after 1945. On one side of the spectrum stood different notions of an egalitarian democracy. American occupation authorities and mostly social democratic policymakers shared the belief in a common democratic education. Youth officials, and I show you one of these uh, highly influential memoranda here, these youth officials wanted that, all, that youth from all swathes of the population should be equally educated for democratic citizenship in a comprehensive school, which should be modeled uh, on the standard of the American high schools, of course. These ideas resonated particularly with social democratic politicians who aspired to build a more egalitarian democracy and a more egalitarian education system on the ruins of the Third Reich. Particularly Christian Democrats and Catholic experts, however, adhere to a different form of egalitarianism, believing that faith-based education will be essential to ground a stable post-war order. Lawmakers around the nascent uh, Christian Democratic Union pressed for re-establishing confessional schools and religious instruction. Um, this is something that the U.S. American uh, occupation authorities and also the, the Social Democrats uh, sought to um, to abolish after. On the other side of the spectrum should stood uh, meritocratic conceptions of democracy. Um, the British, and particularly the French occupation authorities, wanted to make West German schools more meritocratic, seeking to rationalize how schools selected those able for higher secondary education and leading positions in the nascent democracy. Christian and conservative lawmakers, by contrast, championed different schemes, and I'm showing you this memoranda by Josef Schnittenkötter, um, he is one of the most conservative um, school, or he was one of the most conservative school officials in the post four years. They also advocated uh, meritocracy. However, they believed in the superiority of the traditional German tripartite school system, the superiority um, to any uh, allied imposed scheme in terms of its capacity to select the talented for office. And that is the reason why these policymakers, policymakers like Schnittenkötter, for instance, uh, became particularly enthusiastic about reinstalling the ex an exceedingly higher, uh, an exceedingly selective higher secondary uh, school, uh, secondary schools as sites for a democratic elite education. If we want to know how these competing, how these competing ideas of democracy played out in practice, we need to go to the state level. And then in the second part of my presentation, I will turn to post of Berlin but one of the arguably most radical programs to equalize access to democratic citizenship materialized after 1945. In the short-lived period before the um, partition of Berlin, um, social democrats and communists joined forces in drawing up the plan for a comprehensive school. This school wouldn't solely allow for educational mobility, it would also place emphasis on an education towards democracy. Since it would introduce citizenship education classes by conferring on students the rights to form their own student councils and student newspapers. One of the leading social democrats underlined the democratic rationale um, behind this plan. To him, democracy entailed as much equal public education for all as possible, since the new political order required politically responsible citizens from all ranks of society. One of the last endeavors supported by the Allied powers, this comprehensive school became law in June 1948. So just at the time when the hostilities between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union exploded. After the blockade of Berlin, um, the newly established West Berlin uh, city government soon compromised these plans uh, for a comprehensive school. However, with um, the backing of Americans, a number of second and third rank school officials continued to prepare students with different democratic, uh, with different backgrounds for democratic citizenship. So they continued these egalitarian programs, which were first uh, uh, imagined uh, in the wake of uh, the Second World War. They helped initiating a Berlin student parliament and a vocational school parliament to 
in which young persons from all ranks of society debated educational and political issues, and, and this is important, acquired the power to petition the West Berlin government. And these school officials also started courses that brought together young male and female students from lower and higher secondary schools in working class and middle class districts to learn about participation in these newly founded uh, student councils. In many ways, these egalitarian programs responded to the Cold War, dovetailing with many other state-sponsored endeavors to turn West Berlin into a bulwark uh, against the GDR. When we look at how these programs were taken up in the classroom, um, we nonetheless see the limits of these initiatives to reach young persons from all walks of life. Sure, when it comes to citizenship education classes, these programs failed for almost all students. Despite some experiments with citizenship education in the immediate post-war period, and we see one of these um, experiments here on the slide, this is a picture from 1947. Um, nevertheless, these experiments um, with citizenship education, these classes were quietly abandoned in the early 1950s. Some of the former uh, member of, members of the Nazi party were able to return to their teaching positions in the early 1950s, as we all know, and they quietly circumvented the democratic curriculum. Other teachers had more general qualms about citizenship education, equating political education with general indoctrination. Nonetheless, these similarities, a closer look at how students engage in student councils and student newspapers, reveal how young people from different social backgrounds differently made sense of their democratic citizenship. Most of the, of the lower and working class students in lower and middle secondary schools took up a rather obedient citizenship. Even though most of the lower and middle secondary schools and vocational schools established uh, student councils, these councils predominantly took up routine tasks in school life in accordance with the demands of teachers and principals. Only in selected cases, students deployed their councils or issued newspapers to state their claims against teachers and principals. Representatives of vocational schools, for instance, sometimes petitioned the West Berlin city government through the citywide vocational school parliament, but this was only uh, an exception. Um, by contrast, a minority of higher secondary school students championed a more engaged sense of citizenship through student uh, newspapers and student councils. In about one third of West Berlin higher secondary schools, um, students ran their own newspapers, through which they not only reported about school life, but also staked their own claims for participating in school, in school matters. And almost all higher secondary schools established school councils. These forums, sure, they took over routine tasks, yet many of them actively engaged in shaping everyday life in schools and representing the interests of students vis-a-vis -vis teachers, principals, and even school officials. One remarkable example was the Berlin School Parliament, in which higher secondary school students continuously petitioned the government about a reform of higher secondary education. The outrage of politicians and school uh, officials at these petitions prompted the Berlin School Parliament even to issue a conciliatory declaration in 1955, which was issued in many of these uh, parent newspapers, parent newsletters, uh, student newspapers, and uh, even one of the leading um, general newspapers in, in, in West Berlin. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas the, the case of West Berlin epitomizes the post-war attempts to make democracy more equal and the limits of these schemes, the example of Mosul and Westphalia demonstrates how policies um, that wavered between Christian universalism and meritocracy translated into intersecting discrimination. Catholic lawmakers and experts were instrumental in educational policy in post-war North and Westphalia, and I'm showing you some of the, of the books and, and leaflets they issued in the early post-war years. Um, the Christian Democratic Union um, ruled the state, um, North and Westphalia, since its inception. Catholic education experts dominated the school administration, while particularly in the Rhineland area of North and Westphalia, so around the cities of Cologne and Dusseldorf, the Catholic Church vigorously attempted to assert cultural preeminence. <clears throat> Christian Democratic and Catholic 
politician, it did to a Christian universalism that should ground future democratic citizenship. They famously drafted a constitution, a state constitution, and a school law that stated um, that young people needed a, quote, reverence to God, unquote, which would underpin their, um, I'm quoting again, the willingness for social action in the spirit of democracy, and then uh, showing you this, um, this school law here. And this school law quotes the constitution, uh, which was issued uh, two years before. These ideas translated into a wealth of decrees that didn't merely aim at strengthening religious education. These decrees also intended to further the knowledge um, of the symbols, and institutions, and ideas of democracy among the younger generation. In the context of growing Cold War tensions, these programs responded to the GDR, which bombarded Northland Australian schools with propagandistic letters and leaflets in the early 1950s. However, in Northland Australia, Christian universalism merged with meritocratic conviction. Since the immediate post war period, school officials and education experts in Northland Australia were obsessed with what they call elite education. The primary purpose of schools would be to ensure that the most gifted could rise to leadership in democracy. These ideas entailed that school officials geared different schools to what they believed were different talents. This thinking shaped how the different schools prepared the younger generation for democratic citizenship. The government made sure that lower, middle, and vocational schools would prepare students for how to fit into what was called a democratic community. Whereas higher secondary schools would give students more opportunity to voice their interests and to learn how to actively participate in school and society. This meritocratic rationale yielded that lower and working class students only received a limited education towards democratic citizenship. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, lower and working class parents predominantly sent their kids to lower middle and vocational schools in Northland Australia. In these schools, lower and working class youth didn't experience instruction in civics, and neither did they produce student newspapers. In some cases, they set up school councils, yet these bodies only took up routine work in school in accordance with the wishes of teachers and principals. However, at least in some instances, um, these educational schemes produced unplanned consequences um, in these lower uh, um, secondary and vocational schools. And this happened when students championed a more critical citizenship than the state had intended. In some vocational schools, so-called critical students made themselves heard in the early 1950s. Reluctant to take up citizenship education lesson, lessons as intended, these students found fault with democracy, complaining about the uh, discrepancy between lofty ideas of freedom and daunting realities of work life. So where did this disapproval of democracy or the West German system come from? Well, it seems that these students were in contact with socialist and Catholic youth movements, which, from different perspectives, sure, but both condemned much of the culture and politics in the age of the economic miracle. So this thinking that was um, uh, likewise uh, inspired by, by Catholic and socialist thought animated the perspective of these critical students and in lower and vocational schools. The meritocratic uh, programs of, North, of the Northland Australian government also yielded that young women were relegated to a more charitable citizenship. Nonetheless, some girls' schools possessed engaged student councils. Most girls' schools often only took up socially concerned tasks in schools and the public. Girls were informally discouraged from a more participatory citizenship. Yet the rhetoric of leading school officials revealed subtle preconceptions about girls' limited talents for politics. And these prejudices about the qualities of young women explain why teachers and officials directed female students more towards uh, more char charitable activities and not to, towards more parliamentary activities. Um, by contrast, it was the um, tiny fraction of male students with middle to upper class backgrounds that more openly utilized citizenship education schemes to develop and engage in citizenship. These students largely flocked to higher secondary schools, where they set up student councils and newspapers. Here it is important to see that they didn't only use these forums to cooperate in school matters, as the school councils did in, in lower and vocational schools, but they also used the school councils to voice their opinion against teachers and principals. 
a variety of different programs that all predominantly supported these student, student councils and student newspapers of higher secondary schools further contributed to widen the rift between how middle and upper class students and lower and working class students uh, were prepared for democratic citizenship. Arriving at the conclusion, what I basically wanted to do in this talk was to challenge the often told narrative of a rather even expansion of democratic attitudes across all social strata of West Germany during the 1940s and 50s. Rather, my focus um, tried to reveal that social inequality became intrinsic to post-war West German democracy right from the start. Sure, the different initiatives I've briefly touched uh, on today shared a universal belief that all young people needed some sort of introduction to democratic citizenship. However, in practice, these initiatives marginalized young people from different social states. Even the most egalitarian initiatives in West Berlin couldn't prevent that particularly middle to upper class students in higher secondary schools developed a more participatory citizenship, sometimes even in conflict with government and school administration. On the other hand, the example of Mont Westphalia demonstrates that the Christian democratic project of educating a democratic elite of the most talented confined many lower and working class students and female students to a preparation for rather limited citizenship. Yet some of these students didn't simply submit to state-funded programs and coercively uh, made up their own sense of a more critical um, sense of civicness. The different examples of West Berlin and Northern Australia show that schooling contributed to consolidating West German, Germany's stratified democracy in the 1950s, in which students from different backgrounds were exposed to a liberal society uh, in strikingly different ways. Even though the educational reforms of the 1960s and 70s in West Germany largely changed the ways in which West German adolescents across society were prepared for democracy, the conflict of the post-war years introduced some of the fundamental notions of the debate on education, democracy, and social justice that are still with us today. Sure, it is true that the history of, dem of democracy and education doesn't end in 1955, and so does my book project uh, not stop there. What I've presented you today is indeed part of a larger project on the history of education and democracy in West Germany between the 1940s and the 1990s. In this project, I aim to show that we cannot write the history of West German democracy as a mere history of the liberalization of the younger generation from the jokes of tradition or the jokes of national socialism, if you want to say so. Um, rather, I use the notion of governmentality to reveal how policymakers, experts, and educationists try to suddenly govern how young people adapted to democracy. They didn't only accustom the young to their democratic rights, but also suddenly control and sometimes even contain how young people engaged in society. Yet I won't argue that young people simply submitted to these programs. I rather chart the many ways in which the younger generation internalized even subverted state-sponsored messages. I also bring in the perspective of social history, and I've talked a little bit about that today, to reveal that young persons weren't governed in similar ways. For that reason, I'll deploy the notion of intersectionality to understand how officials and experts differentiated between different target audiences and then geared their programs towards the perceived needs of different groups, or what they considered as I hope to reveal that many of these programs, nevertheless their egalitarian pretensions, resulted in differently preparing people from different backgrounds for democratic citizenship. And this is why these programs had fundamental consequences for how young people with different backgrounds responded to these programs and engaged with democracy. And this uh, was specific to the 1950s as it was specific to the educational reforms or the era of educational reforms in the 1960s and 70s. These reforms weren't solely animated by, a, by an egalitarian rationale. At the same time, these schemes were united by a subtle skepticism about the democratic, about the democratic qualities of low and working class youth. I won't go into that today. I just wanted to conclude um, with that I hope to show you that through education, we can throw many of the ambivalences intrinsic to modern democracies into sharp relief. Thank you. <laughs>